Welcome to Akadu and Crosscar Midweek Studies. It is good to be able to share together around God's Word. Let me just share with you a verse which is on our Presbyterian Church in Ireland calendar for the months of March and April. Very appropriate verse at this time. It's taken from the Psalm, Psalm 143, verse 8. And this is what it says. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Amen. And indeed, we look to God at this time. We rejoice in his unfailing love and his faithfulness. And we put our trust in him, because there is no other to turn to. Last week in our Bible study, we continued our study on the life of Elisha. We considered what was really an unfamiliar passage, the pot of stew poisoned by a wild vine. Now that's not true of the story we will consider tonight. The healing of Naaman the leper is one of the best known stories in the entire Bible. A fascinating story with so many lessons to instruct us. And the healing of this man Naaman, while it's not just the story of a leper being healed, of a dreaded disease, it's really the story of salvation. It's an illustration of this, that spirit of salvation is found in Jesus Christ and in him alone. And tonight we're going to read the first 14 verses of Second Kings chapter 5, if you want to follow. And then in God's will, we will conclude the chapter next Wednesday evening. But let's read. And before we do that, let's seek God's guidance and help. Father, we thank you that you are a God who displays unfailing love. A God who is faithful. And Lord, like the Psalms of old, we declare that we put our trust in you. And Lord, we entrust our very lives to you because you are one who is faithful. We thank you that we can turn to your word. And in times of difficulty and anxiety, your word reminds us of your faithfulness. We thank you for Elisha. And we pray that as we study a very familiar passage this evening, that, Lord, you will give us insight and understanding that will be something that we can apply to our lives day by day, that will encourage us, that will challenge us, that will spiritually renew and refresh our souls. We commit this study and we commit each of our lives to you. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Second Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 14. This is the word of God. Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. The bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master could see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Make the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and far for the rivers of Damascus better than any of the waters of Israel? Could not wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Laban's servant went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? 
How much more then when it tells you wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Amen. What we have here in these verses in this familiar story is the story of a desperate man overcoming a feeling of self-importance and experiencing comprehensive healing. The story, Naaman is certainly the central character, but we see the God of Elisha is the one who is truly in control. We note that his prophet Elisha stays clear of the limelight. He doesn't seek glory for himself. As we read through this story, we will also note the key roles of an unnamed servant girl out of anonymous servants to the Syrian general. But as we look at the tragedy of this helpless leper, we learn a great deal about the barriers that keep people from facing their problems and finding salvation in Jesus Christ. Note the crisis, first of all. There is a crisis here, and that word crisis is often used today because of this coronavirus situation. It's certainly appropriate and accurate to deploy that term. There is a crisis in our nation and in many nations in the world. But the crisis here is not international or even national. It is on an individual level. We are introduced to a man called Naaman. Now, Naaman is no ordinary five eighths, as the saying goes, but a man of significance and status. He was military leader of one of the most powerful nations of his day. Now, he was a man who had influence and power. He was a man who was used to making big decisions. The man who would be holding press conferences, one of authority and power and status. He had everything. He had money, power, privilege. He has the king's ear and respect. And it seems he is a popular man, a national hero. Upon his head are the laurels of, and the rays of victory. Upon his chest, no doubt, medals of honour and valour. But his hero status and prestige does not protect him against disease. And note the little word, but. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. And you know that leprosy was common in biblical times. Um, one author describes it as the AIDS of biblical times. So what does he mean by that? Well, several parallels. It could be fatal, of course. It was highly infectious, but one of the greatest parallels it was a thing that brought great stigma. No wealth and no privilege could protect Naaman from the stigma of leprosy, from the social stigma. Now, his leprosy has dramatically and drastically changed his life. His leprosy has left him with a very dismal future. Of course, there are some things that money can't buy, some things that earthly power cannot but obtain. Although he is one of the most powerful men in Syria, Although he has access to the king himself, although he could have anything, or almost anything he wants, Naaman could do nothing to cure himself. Wealth and power and influence will only take you so far. Naaman could defeat an enemy in battle, but he's powerless against this disease of leprosy that is destroying his life. Do you see, right at this point, the lowest ranked soldier wouldn't swap places for this decorated general. He's in a real pit. Indeed, the most ordinary soldier, the most obscure foot soldier of the army would glance at Naaman, would gaze at all his medals and ribbons that adorned his uniform, and he would conclude, as great as he is, and as common as I am, I wouldn't change places with him for one second. Naaman was a leper. Now, the text doesn't explicitly state, but we can assume that he had access to the help of the best medics in the land of Syria, but all to no avail. No one could help. Every avenue, no doubt, had been explored and proved futile. No one could help until a little girl, who was merely a slave to Nima's wife, offers some hope. She speaks up, and she points to a miracle worker in her homeland who can cure the incurable, and that person is Alicia. Now she's in that situation against her will, separated from her family, Possibly, possibly the raiding army has indeed killed her family because you read in verse 2 the bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. There's no mention of anyone else been taken captive. But whatever the circumstances, she's now a captive in a foreign place. But she doesn't display any resentment against her captors. This little girl, who isn't even named, 
proves to be pivotal in the story, for it is her suggestion that sets in motion the events that lead to a physical and a spiritual healing for Naaman. She could herself have felt bitter that God had abandoned her, allowed her to be taken captive, and in turn decided to abandon her faith. But here she is declaring instead of doubting. She has an amazing faith. And more so because there's no previous precedence for her to rely on. There had been no one healed of leprosy by Elisha before that. And that's clear when you go to the book of Luke in chapter 4. Jesus in the conversation says this in verses 25 to 27. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the, in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. In other words, this had never happened before. There had never been one cured of leprosy by Naaman. But she had wonderful faith. Here's the crisis of Naaman. An affliction of, of leprosy has robbed him of his joy over all his achievements. He is burdened personally with the disease, but helpless to do anything about it. There's no cure, and only a miracle can deliver him. And the parallel is very simple. The person who is unsaved is a person who, who's without Christ, and they may be able to find success in their chosen field. They may have great accomplishments and people may applaud them for this. But there's the disease of sin that is ravaging their life and destroying them. And only a miracle from God can deliver them from that sin. Note the crisis. But note secondly the confusion. The advice of the little girl is clear. It's spectacularly clear. But the directions are not followed. Naaman informs his king, the king of Syria. And he in turn moves into action. Not quite catching the part about the Israelite prophet, but hoping he can do something for his military commander, he sends a letter to the king of Israel. And of course, there was nothing about needing the endorsement from the king of Syria or the king of Israel. It was, go to the prophet to be cured. But you see, the thinking, the logic behind their actions, the actions of the king of Syria is this. If healing is to be found in Israel, surely it must come from the most important Hence, he sent Haman with a letter to the king of Israel. So thanks to the king, he's heading to the wrong person, the king of Israel, who isn't even a godly king. But that, sadly, is a picture of sinners going to the wrong place for spiritual healing, often looking to church sacraments, looking to living a good life. And that's what they calculate will be the answer instead of going to God. But there's a second mistake. Not only does he go to the wrong person, but he assumes he can pay for a cure. He leaves, verse 5, with this vast amount of riches, 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 sets of clothing, and an obscene amount of money. And someone has said Naaman had emptied his bank of everything he's got. But of course, the little girl said nothing to Naaman's wife about paying the prophet. She said if only he would see him. He would cure him. She hadn't said if only my master would pay him and pay him well then he'll get a cure. No it was go and see him. And healing comes from going to God's prophet. But here is the confusion with this man. He is unclear about what he is to do. And of course it was typical of that culture to believe that you could pay for healing. And healing for Naaman would be a miracle that he could never possibly pay sufficiently for. It would be a gracious gift to receive, not something he could purchase. And of course, in the spiritual parallel, salvation is by grace alone. Not something we could merit or earn. Naaman, of course, is not alone in his confusion. The Syrian king doesn't get who the healer is. Naaman doesn't get that, but neither does the Israelite king. And we note that he goes into real panic in verse 7. Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? And then he 
comes to this conclusion wrongly. He's trying to pick a fight and quarrel it with me. You see, instead of getting down on his knees and spreading the letter before God, as a later king did, he tears his clothes. He becomes panic-stricken. Now, the little girl, in contrast, has strong faith. His faith, the king of Israel's faith, is non-existent. And Jeff Thomas writes this, Shame on the king of Israel for a sinful shout concerning this letter. Of course he wasn't God, but God is God. Of course the king could not bring back to life, but God could and through Elisha already had. But Elisha hears about the actions of this faithless king, and he says, send Naaman to me. And as a consequence, the desperate commander of Syria sets off to find God's prophet. And as we read what occurs next, we see there remains a lot of misunderstanding in Naaman's mind, but he is more than just confused, as we will see. He is bitter and annoyed. We note the crisis, the confusion, but thirdly, the complaint. Verse 9 informs us that this commander makes quite a spectacle as he arrives at the home of Elisha. We're told the general comes with horses and chariots, and in verse 15, all his attendants. So his diplomatic entourage are on tow. An armed guard, indeed, would have accompanied them also because of the vast amount of of riches and they arrive at the home of the prophet Elisha. I'm sure Naaman wasn't uh, overly impressed, indeed probably totally underwhelmed by what he encountered. Elisha didn't live in the most liberal section with the most desirable postal code. No, he lived in an obscure simple place. He lived in Samaria and you know even the Israelites despised the area of Samaria. But Naaman clearly expects a grand welcome. And indeed he is shocked when Elisha doesn't even come out in person. Instead he sends a messenger to him. But there is a greater shock coming. The method of healing that is suggested by Elisha. Go down into the river Jordan and dip seven times. Naaman complains bitterly. We have come all this way here for this and we read the general went away angry. He said to himself, verse 11, I thought that he would surely come out to me. Now, in the original, the emphasis is on those two words, to me. I thought he would surely come out to me. This is the commander in chief of the army of Syria, one who has traveled all this way to Israel, one who is prominent one who was revered and loved at home. I thought he would have surely come to me. He would have come out in person. And Naaman had expected to see Elisha do some great thing. Instead, there's this notion that he goes into this pathetic river and bathes himself seven times. But you know, at the core of his complaint, there's one thing and one thing only. Pride. Back in Syria, Naaman is revered and exalted and of course back at home when he was sought healing through the gods of Rimmon and the other false gods well there was one thing they had in common a lot of razzmatazzle a lot of shouting a lot of, of spectacle indeed one writer describes the efforts of these false gods back home as choreographed theater but here Haman comes and effectively he supplies the cash and he expects Elisha to supply the magic. He wants something impressive, some razzle-dazzle, not a simple command to go into a muddy river and wash. Here is a proud man disappointed at the ways of God. Now, if he was in the age of Twitter, we can imagine what sort of message he would have broadcast or sent back home to those in Syria. Maybe it would go something like this. I've come all this way to this second-rate country, Samaria. I have written, I have a, a written letter from the king with me. But when I've got to the prophet's house, I found that he lives in a dump, and he hasn't even the grace to come out to see me. Instead, he has sent me a message by some miserable little man to dip in this lousy local river seven times, and then I'd be cured of it. Think of it, the outrage. See, the Jordan River was not impressive, not impressive compared to the rivers back home. And Naaman wasn't impressed with God's methods of healing. 
But the question is this, would he allow pride and prejudice to stand in his path to a cure? Well, it seems so, because he's about to go. He's had enough. He's about to leave. Verse 12, are not abandoned far for the rivers of Damascus better than any of the waters of Israel. Could now wash in them and be cleansed. And the last line, so he turned and went away in a rage. And here's a picture of the proud sinner. Naaman rejects the message because he thinks it's too simple. He already has a preconceived idea of how God would work or should work. And he expects Elisha to come out and perform some ritual to bring about his cure. And you know, spiritually speaking, there are many who believe the gospel message, well, it doesn't fit with their concept of salvation. They reject it because they're offended by the way it's set before them. They're told, acknowledge your sin, repent to Christ and receive him. But that's not their idea. Naaman thought his way was superior to God. He found fault with God's plan. And you see, the Bible tells us in verse Corinthians 1, 18, Paul says the cross, the way of the cross, the way of salvation is foolishness to many. And there are millions every day making the mistake, same mistake as Naaman. They think they can work out their salvation. They think they can do it better, get there on their own, formulate a better plan. That's all part of the devil's schemes. You see, Proverbs 16, 25 says this, is a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. But thankfully, this story has a happy conclusion. Naaman almost went home unhealed, but he relented and listened to the pleading of unnamed servants. We read verse 13. Naaman's servants went to him and said, and note the tenderness here in respect. My father, if a prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? There is a crisis, the confusion the bitter complaint, and finally the healing, the cleansing. So, verse 14, he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Now, to go into the river, what did this great commander Naaman to do? He had to remove all the trappings of power and glory and prestige. He had to take off his metal-laden uniform, helmet, breastplate and belt and stripped down no doubt to his undergarments he had to set that aside and that illustrates that he had to set aside his position his power his glory his pride and you see spiritually when a person comes to god for cure of their sin they must lay aside any achievements credits or righteousness of their own everything that they think has made them good all the things they're hiding behind they have to admit that none of them is even close to being good enough to God. That's why the hymn writer puts it, Nothing in our hands we bring, simply to thy cross we cling. You see, Naaman was like all of us. He had an inflated opinion of his own importance, and as long as he held on to that, he could never get better. He had to come down where he ought to be. That meant giving up his prejudice, laying aside his pride, dipping himself seven times in a muddy Jordan River. Until he did that, he could never get better. There was simply a need for a seismic shift to occur in Naaman's thinking. And this is proof that that seismic shift had occurred. And further proof is that he not only went down into the river, but he fully obeyed. He went onto the muddy waters once, twice. Three times, but didn't stop there. He went a fourth time, a fifth time, a sixth time. And of course, after six times, nothing had changed. But he fully obeyed. And after the seventh time, he was completely healed. Now imagine the scene. Surely there was a sense of anticipation as he dips the seventh time. Every servant has been counting on the shore bank. They're watching, their eyes glued and naming with breathless silence. And he goes on there seventh time, there's this anticipation. But what happens? Well, we read that he dipped for a seventh time, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. His healing was instantaneous. He was fully and perfectly well again. Healed completely. There wasn't a single spot of leprosy remaining. His skin glowed with life and with health. 
and surely there was great excitement at this event. It was a mighty miracle, an instantaneous working of the supernatural power of Almighty God. This incurable disease had been cured by the hand of God, and you know that's a perfect picture of the sinner who follows God's way of salvation. If they follow God's prescribed way, if they turn from their sin and trust in Christ, where they are instantly forgiven, forgiven totally of every sin, they are cleansed completely and adopted into God's family. You see, God's favour cannot be purchased, but God's grace is free to those who receive it with the empty hands of faith. The crisis, the confusion, the complaint, the cleansing. What are the lessons from these verses? Well, let me leave you three very simply. One, God responds to the humble, something that the Apostle James reminds us of. God is a God who resists those who are proud, but he responds to the humble. Secondly, God does not negotiate with sinners. There is no plan B for salvation. There is one way. That's what Peter said in Acts 4.12. And there's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. There is one name only, Jesus. Now some say to preach Christ as the only way to heaven is being dogmatic. It is narrow. But you know, think about it. When an ill person is prescribed a certain drug, and medics say this is the one that will work. Well, no one accuses the doctor of being dramatic. They accept it to be the one. God responds to the humble. He doesn't negotiate with sinners. There is one way only, and that is Christ. And finally, from this story, note that lacking prominence does not mean lacking usefulness. The one that set this healing in motion was a little unnamed Israelite slave girl. And we note also that the servants of Naaman had great influence in this story. We don't have to be prominent or in a high position to be useful to God. Amen. As I close, I just want to share some thoughts and lead you in prayer. On a Wednesday evening, we would normally study God's word and spend time praying. And of course, we want to pray at this time for the situation with coronavirus. We are told, if you read our news bulletins, that the peak here in Northern Ireland is likely to come between the 6th and the 20th of April. So we haven't reached the peak yet. Let's pray for wisdom for those in authority at this time. We give thanks also for the new primary care COVID-19 GP-led centres. Some have opened, more will open. We pray for those affected who have lost family, even in recent days, and some known to us. And indeed, it is sobering. To read that a 12-year-old has died in Belgium, a 13-year-old in Britain, a 14-year-old in Portugal. So it's affecting people of all ages and backgrounds. Let's also be mindful of our church at this time, the Presbyterian Church. The moderator has called for a day of prayer um, for a special time between 3 and 4 p.m. on Palm Sunday. And more will be said about that. And then for ourselves, we give thanks for the work of Alice with the Sunday School Live on Facebook and the encouragement that has been to many and pray that God will bless her as she prepares for that. Then also within uh, Northern Ireland, this new month has brought a change to the abortion law. And there's great irony at this time. Rightly and commendably, we're seeking to save lives because life is precious. But at the same time, there's been a liberalisation of the abortion law, which means there's no protection at all uh, for unborn children up to 12 weeks of pregnancy. Let's pray for the Christian Institute and for Christian politicians and leaders and for the church that we will pray much about this and as we seek to lobby uh, that these uh, these laws would be reversed and there would indeed be more protection for the unborn. Let's come to God in prayer. Father we want to come before you. We want to ask that you would lead and guide us by your Holy Spirit. And we pray for this situation um, that is causing such a crisis in our land. We pray for political leaders, for wisdom and discernment. We think of uh, the government in Westminster and the important and crucial decisions that they make. And Lord, we pray that you would draw near to them, that you would guide them and direct them. 
We think locally of those in Stormont and very particularly the Health Minister, Robin Swan. We think of the Chief Medical Officer and we pray that at all times they will know your guiding hand. We thank you for all involved in the caring community. We thank you for those working in hospitals and for GPs, for nurses and doctors and surgeons and support staff, for those on the front line. We also remember the new primary care COVID-19 GP-led centres, those that have been established and those in the coming days that will be established. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would bless the work that they seek to do. And we ask that you be near to those who are involved in that. But we're very conscious that there are many homes where there's been great anguish and pain because of the loss of a loved one. And Lord, it's sobering when we think that even teenagers are losing their lives to this COVID-19. We ask that in your mercy you will draw near. And Lord, we need your help. Lord, as we were thinking last week in the prayer of Jehoshaphat, we confess that we're confused. We're unsure of what to do. And our eyes are upon you. Lord, draw near. We pray that you be merciful to our land. We pray that your people will humble themselves and turn from all sin. will seek your face and pray. And we pray that in response, we might see your supernatural touch. We might see you healing our land physically and indeed spiritually. Lord, as we think of the crisis at this time within our community, in a medical sense, we know there's also a spiritual crisis. We know our leaders have departed from your ways. We think of this abortion law, which has come into effect in Northern Ireland, and we pray against it. Lord, we know that life is precious, and we know that the unborn is precious to you, and yet so many unborn lives will be lost As a result of this legislation, we thank you for the lobbying of the Christian Institute and for Christian politicians. And we pray that you would give them boldness and courage to continue the fight. And we pray indeed that you would grant to them success. We thank you for our denomination, the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. We thank you for the call for prayer for Sunday. And we pray that that will be responded to well. And many many will see the need to fall on their knees and a cry out to you. We thank you too for the work locally within the congregations in Akadu and Cross Gar. We pray for those who are, are at particular risk at this time, that Lord, you would, you would hold them in the palm of your hand and may they know your grace, your love and your help, that you would continue to protect each one. We thank you for those within the congregations who are involved in front line through hospital work or as nurses or in different capacities. That, Lord, they would know and sense your presence each day. And that, Lord, they would feel the strength of the prayers of your people. We thank you for the work of Alice with the Sunday School Live on Sundays. And pray for her as she would prepare again for the weekend. And we ask, Lord, it will be a great encouragement to the children of these two congregations and many others who will share in fellowship. And finally, we pray for ourselves that in these difficult days, you would help us to focus upon you. And Lord, we praise you that you are a powerful God. You're one who loves us with an everlasting love. May we rest in your presence and know your peace. And Lord, we thank you that we can come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. And we thank you that it is a powerful name. Nothing compares to him. And Lord, we indeed rejoice that death could not hold him. Lord, help us to trust in you, to walk with you each day. And may you bless us richly. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.